African Ascent is um, uh, honored, uh, as it always is, uh, to feature uh, one of the latest um, leading um, radical thinkers in the country, uh, Professor Victor Wallace, who has served as editor of Socialism and Democracy for over 30 years and continues to be one of the top brasses, as we say, at Berkeley College of Music, in which he is a professor of political science. Um, among his uh, numerous books, uh, which will be very long to list, is his most recent book on um, American politics, um, the title of which uh, briefly uh, escapes me. Uh, you'll fill in the gap later. Um, for viewers um, like my viewers who've been uh, watching um, African Ascent as it is launched to you uh, from um, Merrill's uh, television station, which is the home of African Ascent, um, about um, three weeks ago, uh, we had done uh, a, a one hour and a half long uh, feature on the elections. And we agreed at the end of that first interview that we're going to come back to do a sequel, a follow-up. And that is exactly what we're going to do. And um, unlike the first time, which was heavily theoretical, um, uh, the, 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 as one might say, this one is going to be um, concrete, grounded uh, in what is going on today as I speak to you. Uh, so that um, my viewers, uh, some of whom may be undecided, uh, could vote for the uh, view for the uh, candidate uh, that you favor uh, intelligently, uh, thoughtfully, and um, in a very responsible manner. So this particular uh, feature is an attempt to inform the viewer. And I trust that my guest is going to give a very judicious and politicized interpretation. What the meaning of this election is, what the policy differences are, uh, between the vice president and the uh, current incumbent of, of the office, uh, and um, we'll take it from there. Uh, so let me begin with uh, a general question uh, to set the stage, uh, namely, the, uh, namely this. Um, uh, Professor Victor Wallace, what is your read of the current political situation in the country? as it relates to the elections. How would you frame and um, uh, ground uh, the situation in the country now? I think we're in the midst of a crisis which can be described perhaps as threefold. People sometimes forget that we're in an envir environmental emergency. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change projected in 2018 that we had only until 2030 to decisively reverse course uh, in order to have a sustainable future. That is part of the crisis. Uh, then of course, there is the obvious pandemic, the COVID crisis, and then there's the economic crisis. And the, the economic crisis is one of the regular ones that comes with capitalism, but it has of course been exacerbated by the pandemic crisis so that we are now in the condition of a a depression uh, on a level with that of the 1930s in terms of its impact on the population. I mean, that there's desperate poverty, there's increase in poverty, 8 million just recently added to the ranks of the poor, uh, millions and millions, uh, I think 60 million have uh, applied for unemployment at some point uh, since the pandemic began. And so, and people who have enjoyed a moratorium on rent payments, they're still going to have to pay their rents. Uh, there's, a, there's a desperation in the population that has to be kept in mind. So, so that's the basic framework. And in terms of the poli uh, political background to it, this situation is the joint responsibility of both the major parties in the United States, that both have been collaborating in the dismantling of the New Deal reforms that were instituted in the 1930s. And I say both because, for example, during the Clinton administration, the Democratic administration in the 1990s, they dismantled welfare, they dismantled regulation, they set the stage for uh, hyper speculation. Uh, all this was continued under George W. Bush and with Obama, when he was elected in 2008, there was hope that there would be some kind of they actually spoke back then of a new deal. 
and he gave all kinds of uh, grounds for optimism, you might say, uh, uh, with his background as an organizer and his uh, populist appeal, and, and the very fact of his being a person of color, uh, being raised to the position of highest office. But uh, the meltdown of 2008, uh, the financial meltdown, uh, did not lead to a recovery for the majority of the population. Many people were left in a condition of poverty. They were, they were disappointed. And so there was the basis for all kinds of discontent. The result of this was that many people were open to radical changes and really wanted them. And that socialism was for the first time again uh, in almost a century becoming a popular idea in the United States. It had joined us a slight uh, revival in the 1960s, but much more so at the present time. And so it was in the, and the, the Democrats in the administration of Obama failed to satisfy the demands for popular changes like universal health care. That was the best known. They failed to satisfy those demands, setting the stage for a demagogue like Trump uh, to come in and uh, using all kinds of uh, scapegoating, which are well enough known now, to, to rally the frustrated constituency at the base uh, while pursuing a policy that was strictly of benefit, an economic policy that was strictly of benefit to the top fraction of a percent of the population. So the, the condition that we're in now is one that has been set by both the major parties and the two parties together have had a kind of entente, you might say, or a collaboration in effect, that, that each of them has persuaded its own constituency to vote for it on the basis of a negative characterization of the other party. And of course, the negative characterization made by the Democrats of, of the Republicans and of Trump is very accurate. They, uh, they point to his white supremacism, his racism, his uh, uh, xenophobia, his misogyny, all that absolutely on point. Uh, the Republicans, on the other hand, turn back and they try to discredit the Democrats by characterizing their leadership as socialist, even though in fact it isn't. Or they say at least that the Demo leadership is uh, at the service of the socialists or controlled by the socialists. So, so you have the Republican base which is a, a kind of anti-socialist, anti-communist uh, ideology, but propelled by uh, racism uh, and the, the democratic base, which is willing to support a continuation of the neoliberal policy simply because it's less bad, because the, let's say the leader of it is less offensive than, uh, than the Republican leadership. So we really have a case in which uh, the, the two parties are both, whichever one wins the election, it'll still be necessary in terms of getting a decent government policy for the population. It'll still be necessary to have terrific popular pressure, whichever one wins. Within, within this context, you, you then can make the comparison. So, so what are the conditions? Which outcome will make the conditions a little less bad uh, for, to pursue this basic aim of combating the, the, the crises I mentioned at the beginning, the, the environmental crisis, the health crisis, and the economic crisis. Okay. Uh, as you know, the uh, two debates, um, so-called debates, um, which are uh, questionable um, as formulations of debates, uh, were somewhat disappointing to the, to the average viewer, uh, particularly to uh, intelligent viewers uh, who wanted to vote on the basis of the policy differences between these two candidates. Uh, let's assume that um, in spite of the vacuousness of the debates, that you on your own have managed to glean the main differences between um, the two candidates and their policies uh, for the sake of our viewers, uh, particularly those who have not decided yet who are getting ready to vote tomorrow. Uh, how would you summarize uh, what the differences, uh, visions, and uh, possibilities and content of these two candidates? 
Well, the difference is in Take basic time, policy. And I would like you to do it in detail yeah. for, for yeah. the sake of a viewer who uh, right. wants to vote on the basis of understanding the policies themselves. Yeah. The differences in basic policy are, are relatively small. I mean, the, uh, they both are committed to a neoliberal program, which is the, what, the label that can be used to describe what I've just narrated before as the dismantling of the New Deal. What that means is uh, an ultra-capitalist approach, uh, deregulation, and so on. So they're both committed to that, uh, in the, in the, and they're both committed to uh, intervention in foreign, uh, in foreign politics on behalf of U.S. imperial interests. In fact, they outdo each other in trying to, uh, to justify that. So I, I, and in terms of actual policies, uh, Biden has made a point of distancing himself from the progressive currents within his own party. Uh, he's made a point of distancing himself from healthcare for all, uh, distancing himself from uh, the attempt to stop fracking, for example. He's very explicit about that in, in, in the debates. So the point, the point is that what you have is a situation in which you have these two candidates. Uh, uh, you, you get from the media uh, a kind of uh, reporting on the words uttered by the intelligence community, so forth, uh, so-called, you know, the, uh, the, the deep state, the CIA, and so on, uh, which attempt to portray uh, Trump as a tool of the Russians and Biden as a tool of the Chinese or perhaps of the Iranians, uh, provoking each of them to move in the direction of being more uh, antagonistic to, towards those respective countries. So you have a contest between two people both of whose leadership will uh, result in a continuation of the, of the disastrous policies. Uh, the, there's a difference in terms of the response to the pandemic. Uh, how deep it will go, I don't know. I mean, uh, Trump has openly uh, scoffed at any protective measures for the pandemic. Uh, Biden has differentiated himself from that. Uh, that can be uh, a, a difference that, that I think will take on uh, some, some importance. And, and so I, I would uh, acknowledge that difference among them. Um, but the real point, and I think what people really need to know, is that we as citizens, if we want to change the kinds of uh, outcome that we have, we have to do more than just vote in the election. Because even if Biden wins, and even if his victory is uncontested, which I don't think it will be, I think it's going to be contested, that's very clear. But even if he wins, even if he ends up winning, the pressure will have to continue to be unremitting because his policy differences on basic issues are, are, are quite limited. Where the, you have significant differences is within the Democratic Party, that some of the newly elected, uh, more progressive members of Congress both in, tw in 2018 and uh, from what it looks like uh, from the primaries in this year, there are going to be more progressive members in Congress, which is a good thing. But the leadership of the Democratic Party has been uh, very reluctant to uh, take a, steer a radically different course. In fact, the, uh, the top funders of the Democratic Party said uh, during the primary season that they would rather continue, and I'm speaking specifically of uh, Lloyd Bank, uh, Blankfein of the uh, Wall Street, uh, they would rather continue under Trump than risk having Bernie Sanders uh, be, uh, be the leaders. So the, the Democratic Party will need to be uh, pushed very strongly, uh, even if they win. So I, I, for me, the ultimate uh, difference between the, the two outcomes has to do with the conditions under which it's possible to hope and strive for a, a better set of policies. And I should also add that the forces that Trump has unleashed, uh, which are attempting to intimidate voters and control the election, you know, threatening voters physically, uh, including not only vigilantes, but also the police, as was shown yesterday in the incident in North Carolina. Uh, these, these forces are not gonna go away. Uh, they, they will, 
perhaps uh, it, it'll perhaps be slightly uh, more possible to restrain them uh, under a Democrat, but uh, they will not go away. That they'll be complaining, and, and, and as I said, Trump is not going to let this thing uh, get away easily. So I would say there are enough differences between them to be worthy of a vote, but not to be worthy of our thinking that once uh, Trump has been defeated, uh, that will be the end of the story. That's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. What is the likelihood, um, in your judgment, having been um, studying the kind of politician that uh, Biden um, had been uh, for the past 47 years, if uh, when you say uh, protests from the ground uh, continues to be uh, hailed at him, uh, how likely do you think is it uh, for him uh, to um, respond to these uh, protests unfavorably and try to contain them. Uh, the, 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 the radical departure from anything socialist, uh, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, seems to incline in that direction, uh, that he takes great pride in being a centrist and in that he is going to uh, fight for upholding that center uh, on the basis of which he's going to be elected uh, to continue uh, guaranteeing the, the respect and support of the middle class and sections of the working class. Uh, the implications of which for the left, uh, for the progressive left, are quite grave. Right, yes. I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, I think he's essentially going to try to, tr to ignore uh, these demands. Uh, and so what we have to uh, understand is that it'll be necessary to, to push him and to, to, to make it a, an irresistible public kind of pressure. And I mean, this goes back, you can find parallels. I mean, even in the case of Franklin D. Roosevelt and the New Deal, his initial inclination was not in the direction that he ultimately pursued. There had to be tremendous movement from below on the part of the working class, uh, organizing in labor unions and the socialists and the communists. There was massive pressure of that kind. Another parallel that's been drawn more recently is the case of, of Nixon, who certainly was a conservative a uh, conservative Republican, but under whose administration uh, they passed all kinds of uh, environmental protection measures uh, that were uh, of, la of lasting importance. So uh, there'll have to be tremendous popular pressure. It, we cannot count on Biden himself, but the, the fact that there are progressive elements within his party, that there may be c communication possible through various intermediaries, the way these things go, uh, leaves open uh, the possibility that he can be pushed in the necessary direction. And certainly if there's a, a, a more progressive trend in the House, uh, he can be uh, presented with legislation that he'll be under pressure to sign. I, I think uh, in this election, I, I, would not over, I would not put the exclusive emphasis on the presidential contest, because I think it's been, a, a lot of commentators have pointed out that even if Biden wins, if the Republicans retain control of the Senate, uh, they'll be able to be an, an effective block on anything he can do. Uh, they will block any, for example, change in the Supreme Court, which is a, has become a big issue, as I think is widely enough known. So it's the, the Senate election, I mean, in terms of speaking to the voters, is, is extremely important. It's, it's important to flip the Senate, as, as, as they say, so, because uh, McConnell has played this uh, incredible role, which I think people are pretty well aware of. Uh, during the Obama presidency, he blocked, uh, of course, not only the uh, f uh, filling of the seat left by Scalia uh, almost a year before the election, uh, but also the appointment of many federal judges in, at lower levels of the judiciary, leaving the, the, the way open for Trump to sort of really pack and I use the word advisedly, to pack the federal judiciary with young conservative people at, at every level. And, and of course, we all know how he's rushed through the appointment and confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett. So uh, this is a major obstacle and a major factor in, in, the, um, in projecting the election. So uh, lo looking for, for a change uh, in, in the context of the Senate, uh, very important. Uh, and I do want to stress in, in a kind of general way, going back to the overall picture, that we live in, in a country in which it has become customary 
to contest elections, to advance one's political position, not by persuading the opposition, but by suppressing it. Uh, so the Republicans, it's quite clear that if there were a fair election right now, if this election is, well, to the extent that it's fair, that is to say, to the extent that everyone who wants to vote gets to vote and gets to have their votes counted, Trump would lose. That, there's little question about that. The, the only hope he has for victory is by some kind of manipulation, uh, much of which has already been set in motion by the sabotage of the post office, by stripping voters from the rolls in certain states, by passing strict laws, by closing down uh, early voting, by like in Texas, for example, limiting to just one place per county for people to cast early votes, including even in the city of Houston, where there's a county of 4 million people, there's only one place for them to cast their vote. I mean, all these things that have done to suppress the vote and even having the police come in as they did in North Carolina, blocking hundreds of people who were about to go to vote on the last day of early voting. This is the, is the, the method of choice. And, and plus, of course, we have to keep in mind the, the mechanisms that are made possible by the constitutional arrangement that with the dates from the 1780s. Uh, and that, as I think is fairly well known, the electoral college and the system of representation in the Senate all devised to accommodate the slave owners in that period uh, with uh, disproportionate representation for states with lower populations. Uh, in the case of the South, it was because the, the populations of, of, the, of the, uh, the white population at the time of slavery was, was very, very small. And they, they had to have a representation that included uh, the, uh, the, the enslaved people, uh, but uh, even without allowing them, obviously, by definition, uh, to, uh, to vote. So all these, the, the methods bequeathed by that, which now uh, in the immediate present uh, raise the possibility, uh, again, going back to the constitutional arrangement, that state legislatures controlled by Republicans could uh, order the electors, even in states where the Democrats were winning, they could order the electors to vote for the Republicans and bring about an electoral, uh, electoral college victory for Trump in, in that manner. And so, the, and, and then of course, this is the question, if there's a no uh, clear electoral college outcome of it's going into the House of Representatives, where again, you have this uh, crazy uh, arrangement where, whereby the, uh, the votes are just one vote per state, regardless of how populous the state is. So there are all kinds of ways in which uh, uh, Trump can, uh, and, and his forces can pull out a victory without in any sense having a majority of the, of the population behind them. The only thing I would add to that is that this, this custom of winning by suppression rather than by persuasion is something that the Democrats also engage in because they systematically, their approach to the challenge from the Green Party, which represents a kind of uh, program that is somewhat similar to the left wing of the Democratic Party, progressive program, healthcare for all, Green New Deal, and so on. Um, their method of c combating them is to uh, try by lawsuits to get them removed from the ballot. And we also know that the presidential debates are organized, the Commission on Presidential Debates is not a nonpartisan uh, organization. It's a bipartisan Republican Democrat organization, and they both agree to keep out uh, anyone else whose uh, positions, whose arguments might, uh, might embarrass them and might, on the other hand, educate a, a portion of the public to positions which otherwise are not sufficiently articulated. So we're in a kind of uh, situation where uh, you have a, a, a system in crisis with the leaderships of both parties incapable of solving the crisis in a way that benefits the population and where the demand or let's say the, 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 the obligation, the responsibility to get out of it is really thrown onto us as a people, as a population to put up, to create by our presence and by our organized presence, a, a new po uh, political demand, or let's say a demand which reinforces 
some of the more uh, progressive sectors that are present now within the Democratic Party, but that could be strengthened from outside uh, to respond to the crisis. And I, I know that in the short run, I, I, I think there's wide consensus to the effect that um, this is going to be contested because Trump has already announced uh, that, that he, he won't accept a negative outcome. And he intends, uh, if there's any uh, manifestation of a lead uh, on election day, uh, to attempt to disqualify anything that's counted after election day, even though the vast, uh, a considerable, a huge percentage of the votes uh, will, will be counted only after election day because of the laws of, uh, of, of the different states. And so you have this really uh, quite amazing uh, situation. Okay. And now, uh, Victor, uh, there are those who uh, think, perhaps uh, optimistically, uh, that given Biden's age, um, four years from now, he may consider not to run again, uh, but may encourage his vice president, who is considerably younger than him, and who is also considered to be, um, according to Ronald Trump and others, um, a liberal, a super liberal. What is the likelihood of um, Pamela, Pamela Harris, four years from now, uh, being more suitable for the agenda of the progressive left than Biden could ever be? What is uh, your assessment of her as a politician? Uh, thinking four years from now, yeah. uh, there is uh, 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 there isn't much that she could do now because the position that she occupies is that of a loyal follower, and that rather uh, that is rather obvious. Uh, but four years from now, if she decides to run for for the presidency, assuming that Biden wins, um, how uh, suitable w would she be to work with the uh, with the radical left? Uh I, I honestly don't think it's uh, really useful to speculate at this point about four years from now in, in, in a Biden presidency, I, because I, I think uh, whether, he, whether he wins, uh, yeah, yeah, even if he wins, uh, everything is going to depend on, on what's done by the popular organizations. I, th I think in general, we are accustomed in this country to focusing too much on the personalities uh, and the, the individual traits of particular politicians, as though that's what is going to uh, really uh, be, be determinative. I, I think that uh, uh, both what positions she would occupy and uh, the willingness of the, uh, of the democratic leadership uh, to accept uh, a, a position, let's say, if, if it is more progressive, uh, is all going to depend on what is done by, by the masses of the people organized really uh, independently uh, of the democratic party leadership, even if it's under the umbrella, like, for example, the uh, the Sunrise Movement or the Bernie Sanders uh, Our Revolution Organization, which are sort of within the Democratic Party, but they're independent of its leadership. E everything depends on, on, on what they will do. And so that's what we have, have to focus our interest on, is, is what we the people can do. And then the, uh, if, we, if we have an impact, uh, then either we will get uh, someone who more closely reflects our, uh, our priorities, or we, we may persuade someone like Kamala Harris possibly to, to move in a more appropriate direction. I, I would say offhand, just in terms of her uh, looking at, at, her, at her record, uh, she is very much a, an establishment politician. And uh, has, uh, so it, it, there's no, I, I wouldn't want to put, uh, uh, rest my confidence in her, so to speak. Okay. And now uh, we have about uh, 30 minutes left and um, I would like us now to focus on um, your assessment um, of what the outcomes um, are going to be, uh, wear your hat as a political scientist and um, give uh, the viewer um, an assessment of where things are right now, between now and tomorrow if you've been closely following the reports of the news media, state by state, with projections and assessments, um, uh, I, I would like yours to be the best and uh, somewhat different from what the uh, regular media 
is giving uh, the viewers. Again, I'm trying to appeal to those who have not decided yet uh, to decide yeah. intelligently. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I don't claim particular expertise in, the ter in terms of uh, every, uh, following every state, but I, I have a few uh, general observations that might be important. Uh, one is that uh, I, I don't trust the polls entirely. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's quite possible that uh, people who support Trump may not want to say that to pollsters. Uh, the, there's uh, the last minute uh, processes that are taking place uh, could have a, a terrific impact. Uh, so, so I don't know about that. Um, I, I think that uh, what, what we have to think about really is uh, the, the underlying demands that we have. Uh, in, in terms of people deciding uh, their vote, they should be asking about concrete outcomes that they want. And if, if, you, if as is the case of the majority of the population, you want a, uh, out, uh, an outcome that, well, for, for example, the, to, to take one issue that we haven't discussed yet, this is, again, one of the big undebated issues because there's a consensus between the two dominant parties. The role of the military industrial complex. The, the power of the military industrial complex uh, stands in the way of all the progressive measures that would need to be taken to improve the condition of the majority of people in this country. And there, there is a majority in, in polls that favors less uh, of public expenditure on the military budget and more on social uh, programs. So uh, if you want to get that, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter what state you're in, you, you, you're better off, uh, well, first of all, having to get rid of Trump. I mean, my position is that, uh, that I, I support the, the program of the Green Party. And if you're in a state where the Democrat versus Republican outcome is uh, not in question, is overwhelmingly in one direction or the other, use the opportunity to vote for uh, a party that really supports the kinds of changes uh, that are widely desired. Uh, how, however, I've signed a public statement which uh, said that, that, that if I did live in a state where the Democrat and Republican outcome was unsettled, unsure, uncertain, the so-called battleground states, I would cast my vote for Biden for the, for the reasons that I've explained. Uh, which is not that they have any fundamental policy differences, but that the conditions for further advancing our work at the, at the base level would be slightly less bad. And we'd also be slightly less assaulted by the pandemic uh, if, if the Democrats were in the leadership. But I would emphasize that it's, again, to underscore for the vo for voting process, it's not just the presidency, it's the, the, the Senate is extremely important. And the, the House, I presume, will remain uh, Democrat, but this, this, the Senate uh, really has to, be, there have to be some upsets in the Senate in order for that, uh, for that to be possible. How likely that upset in the Senate? I understand that um, Leslie Graham, uh, for example, in North Carolina, uh, seems to be in jeopardy. He is being challenged by um, a promising uh, African-American candidate. I think his name is Harrison. Uh, Harris or Harrison? Uh, I may be mistaken. And uh, there are those who think that uh, he might win. How likely is that? I, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I, I can't claim to project those, those outcomes. I, I mean, the pollsters can't do it. So how, how, that there how, has to be how, an how could I do it? in the Senate. And I'm asking you to, 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 to hypothesize what the likelihood is. Yeah. I don't know what the likelihood is. I really can't uh, say. I, I, all, all I can say is that uh, it, it, one has to hope that, uh, that, there'll be, that there will be such an outcome. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not close enough to the situation. I'm, I'm not a journalist on the ground uh, looking at, at what people are saying uh, directly. So, so I, I have to go on the, on the general reports. And yes, it seems to be uh, quite possible that he will be overturned. There have been a lot of uh, there have been triumphs like that and, and disappointments also uh, on, a, on a similar uh, similar scale. So, uh, yes, the, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I can't directly answer your question. I, I don't know whether it's uh, 
what's mm. going to be the, the outcome. I, I just what, have would you, what should you want the voter to do? Uh, take about uh, 10 minutes or so and uh, advise uh, the gullible voter. Uh, the voter is too busy to pay attention or the voter who is uh, suffering uh, because of um, economic curtailments and uh, other matters. What should the voter do? Um, uh, wear the hat of a political theorist and advise the voter, guide the voter uh, to think intelligently. I would, the first thing I would say is don't think of yourself just as a voter. Think of yourself as a full citizen. And here uh, you will like my uh, going back to Greek philosophy and the, uh, that Aristotle defined a citizen as someone who participates in the, in the affairs of state. Uh, consider yourself not just as someone who is choosing between two rival factions who claim that they will do what's necessary, but rather think of yourself as an activist who together with others like yourself will take the, the matter into your own hands. That is to say that you will, you will formulate what's necessary, you will create the pressure uh, to, to bring it about, and you will create a kind of uh, unanswerable uh, pressure uh, to bring about the kinds of changes uh, that we urgently need and that are not really uh, in the forefront of the uh, positions put forward by the leading exponents of the, of the two respective parties. And so again, I'm thinking of, well, the healthcare for all, which is the, the one that's been most in the public eye and from which Biden has unfortunately distanced himself. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a, perhaps uh, a public works programs. This is something that was instituted in the no, New Deal that yes. no one talks about now. That is to say, you have vast unemployment, you have vast uh, process of conversion that needs to take place in order to address the, the environmental crisis. There's a tremendous need for work to be done to transform the economy and the society in an pro-environmental direction, this is an issue that uh, should be raised and should be impressed upon, upon both uh, the dominant, well, uh, the Republicans are unalterably opposed to it. But, but let's say uh, the, the, the Democrats, some of them could be open to it, but it hasn't really been raised. Even in the context of discussion of the Green New Deal, it hasn't been so much a uh, discussion of public works, but more uh, just a kind of matter of incentivizing private industry to do certain things that are necessary. No, we're in a situation of, of dire emergency and urgent public works are, are necessary. And people can be discussing the kinds of changes that are needed in their own communities and can put forward proposals and it can be raised up uh, uh, to distinct levels so that it eventually reaches a national level. But the, the, the idea is uh, we have to be more proactive. The, uh, the posture of citizen spectators uh, or spectator citizens has not worked. It, it's led us to this situation where we, we are in a kind of uh, failure of the, of the system where, where it's imposed really catastrophic conditions on tens of millions of people. I mean, the, the, I heard recently that, that almost half of the, of the US population is in a situation of economic precarity. Yes. This is disastrous. And it's not being, uh, the, the debates that are held at the, at the presidential level are, are simply not addressing this. And the, the Democrats for years have just been talking about the middle class and haven't been willing to address the question of, of poverty. So, so, so these, are, these are things that need to be done. And I, I think also the whole question of, of changing there's a need to change the culture because the, the culture which permits the kind of racist uh, attacks, assaults on people, this goes back to the very beginnings of the country's history. And this has to be attacked really at, at every level. And of course, this is partly something that can be done um, at a community level, but it, eventually also has to have its expression at a political level, but it has to be a, a continuous project that goes on, goes on all the time. And so, uh, again, to come back to the way you phrased the question originally, um, we as, as citizens 
uh, need to help create organizations, uh, political organizations, uh, that may or may not affiliate with existing ones, but that need to present uh, a full uh, articulated program of, of what we need and, and not just accept the terms of the debate that are offered to us by the two dominant parties in this country. Okay. And I'm sure you noticed this, uh, perhaps you didn't, uh, but I'll be surprised if you did not. Even in the second presidential debate, which in contrast to the first was uh, considerably better, uh, the moderator was um, reasonably good. Uh, one of the burning themes in the country, at least in the African-American communities, the question of reparations was not even acknowledged as an issue, which in your language is inextricably intertwined with the particular kind of poverty that afflicts African-American communities. I wonder if Biden is elected if you would be sufficiently culturally and racially, uh, racially competent to take on the issue of reparations that some noted African-American uh, thinkers, uh, politicians um, are um, insisting uh, must be addressed. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I know uh, that for you, reparations is too analytically isolated from the, rush, um, the larger issue of um, uh, poverty. Um, I agree with you, uh, but, but reparations is also a specific instantiation of poverty, which is linked to the history of slavery. Mm -hmm. How could this issue um, be, be brought to uh, be an issue that must be attended to if uh, Biden is elected? I think the issue needs to be raised in the context of a wide movement uh, for, for all the kinds of changes that, uh, that we've been speaking of. It's, it's uh, the, that within the broad, uh, I don't know if I should use the word coalition mm -hmm. or alliance or grouping, uh, something really that involves a, a, an organization that's more than just a loose alliance. But uh, within this broad grouping, uh, every sector of the population uh, that has been uh, put at a disadvantage it needs to be represented. And within the context of such a, such a broad movement, uh, the particular demands of, of particular sectors of the population uh, can, be, uh, can be addressed and uh, should be articulated and can be addressed. And I would, I would add in a more general way, but that speaks to that, that such a broad movement, of, let's say of, of the popular majority, which uh, uh, the working class and middle class uh, together uh, really, uh, the, it's a natural development that the leadership of, su of such a movement uh, should gravitate towards the, the constituency within it that has been uh, the most uh, grievously harmed by the whole collection of policies that have been in place up to now. This, this will just be a natural development. It's not a kind of thing that can be legislated, but it's, it's just that let's say there's more of a mass awareness of the need for change among those who have been the most oppressed. So it, it's a natural thing that they will uh, throw up from their midst uh, the type of leadership uh, that can articulate in a popular way, uh, but at the same time with deep understanding uh, what is necessary. And the, others, uh, the other portions of that majority uh, co coalition or alliance or organization uh, we'll, we'll have to accept that. We'll, we'll be, it's not just that they'll have to accept it. It'll be natural for them to accept it, that, that these will be the most powerful leaders. And I, I mean, I, one sees, uh, let's say, an embryonic expression of this in the prison movements that are taking place right now, because in the, the whole experience, the historical experience of mass incarceration, which is really quite uh, unique to this country in a way, has uh, created a new generation of revolutionary leadership, which is mostly African-American. And the, the more uh, aware and, and sensitive and perceptive uh, prisoners who are not African-American recognize this and accept their leadership. 
And within this context, uh, and in the context of a whole organization which groups together all these different constituencies, the particular demands of any one of them can be, uh, can be discussed and worked out and it can be part of a, of a wider program. So, so that it's not singling out a particular group, but it's nonetheless responding to its interests. I appreciate the response. That was um, full-fledged. And finally, I hate to uh, end the uh, episode on a pessimistic note, um, but uh, let me do so, because we're going to come back and do a third part on um, a post-election analysis sometimes in the future. So suppose uh, that um, uh, President Donald Trump wins. What are the activities of the progressive left going to be, if they could be? Since, hypothetically speaking, uh, if he wins, you would consider the marches, the, the protests, um, to use this language, to be the uh, activists of anarchists and uh, terrorists. Mm -hmm. And in that, the breathing space uh, for the progressive left is going to be considerably mitigated, if not diminished. Yeah. Well, uh, again, uh, first of all, you always have to look at the condition of the hypothesis. Uh, he's not going to win the majority of the vote. If, if he stays in power, uh, that's what your question is. If he stays in power despite that, uh, we're going to be in a situation of, 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 of chaos uh, in which the contours are quite difficult to imagine, except that it'll be very, uh, it'll be a state of turmoil, tumult, uh, whatever you say. So the, the progressive community, uh, the, the radical revolutionary, all the sectors of, of the left, all the sectors that embody uh, the desire for a different order uh, of the society, uh, they'll be on the defensive. Uh, they'll have to somehow uh, protect themselves uh, while at the same time not giving up their advocacy. Because I think one thing you can say is that, that even though it will create very difficult conditions for working and possibly dangerous conditions. It will also open more and more people's eyes to the uh, incapacity of the system to satisfy people's basic needs, to satisfy most people's basic needs. So it'll bring more people into the awareness uh, that's necessary. So, so that's, that's the positive side. At the same time that you have the negative side, that all the efforts at, at, at propagating our views and so on will be uh, more dangerous, more risky. Um, so uh, it's, it's really a, uh, it's, I don't know, a kind of crossroads situation, a, a, very, a very challenging situation. Uh, uh, the, the outlines are unclear. Uh, all, that's, all that's clear is that it's going to be a, a period of, of turmoil. And, uh, and as I said earlier, I, th I think that this uh, risk will to some extent exist anyway, because the, since the Trump forces are unwilling to accept a, a Biden victory, even if, even if it is finally imposed, say, say if even Trump is somehow forced out of office, uh, his forces will, will, will not go away. But that's why there's a need for this whole cultural change to reduce the uh, attractiveness of, the, of those forces. And I think we say one of the, the hope aspects of what, what was projected earlier by, by Sanders is the idea that one could win away some of the base of Trump by showing a, a program that could actually meet their economic needs in a way that Trump's doesn't. I mean, Trump gives, tries to give them a, a, a satisfaction that replaces the satisfaction of their economic needs uh, by uh, venting their, their hatred and their, their racism and so on. Uh, I mean, you see some of the uh, these rallies where they're going and uh, sickening themselves and they're not improving their economic condition. They're, they're, they're not, they're people who are not well off, but so there, there needs to be uh, at the same time, a, a, a kind of cultural uh, counter attack. I don't know if that's the best term to use a, a kind of cultural response, but at the same time, an economic policy that will actually bring them out of that, situation. But I, I think what we will see, say, so assuming that Trump continues in office, the, the conditions, the general conditions will get worse, uh, both in terms of the health 
and in term and in economic terms, because uh, the the country is uh, as uh, Richard Wolf has pointed out, it, the the economy is on life support. The, the that is to say that the government has just said that it's uh, the Federal Reserve's are available to to bail out the corporation, keep keep them going, but without the capacity to uh, run a, a functioning common economy that that uh, satisfies the needs of the majority of the people. So all the time that we're trying to uh, protect ourselves, defend ourselves against attacks, uh, it's at the same time a learning period in which the, uh, the conditions for a stronger popular response will have to develop. And again, I think that the prison situation is perhaps a model for this because the people who are in prison, uh, many of whom uh, are in there for offenses, having uh, re reflecting their condition of poverty, uh, they are, uh, say, the first ones who are uh, subjected to this extreme re repression, and they are showing a, a capacity and a motivation to uh, understand what the source of their oppression is and to organize against it. So the rest of the population will have to take a bit of a lesson from these people who, under adverse conditions, have uh, improved themselves of uh, in intellectually and, and organizationally. It's, it's just uh, one of the complexities of the situation in which we live. Okay, and finally, uh, to, 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 to add another um, pessimistic question uh, to end the episode. Uh, suppose Biden wins, on, on the other hand. If we are to take his pledge seriously, he, that he's going to be an American president, the president of all Americans. The analytic implication uh, is that he's not going to necessarily kowtow to the Sanders faction um, that you've been um, ably uh, articulating that will make an attempt to push him in a radical direction. And then what? Well, I mean, saying that he's going to be the president of all Americans, that's, that's purely rhetorical. I mean, it's impossible to serve simultaneously the interests of, the, of the, the billionaires and the interests of the majority of the people, because those two sets of interests are antagonistic. So his, uh, his primary uh, commitment, uh, as he uh, expresses in various ways, and certainly by his, uh, the contributions that he solicits and accepts, his primary loyalty is to the ruling class. And uh, the only way that, that any policies that he'll be able to uh, brought to approve any policies that, that are to the benefit of the majority is by uh, enormous pressure, uh, partly uh, transmitted through Congress uh, that will uh, put him in the position of having to do that. And let's say p politically in the sense of having to show that he can provide some uh, benefit, uh, even if it's a small one, uh, that was not provided by the previous administration. Here I'm thinking partly of, of the health thing, but which will have to go much further than what he's indicated he's willing to do. Okay. Well, this has been a host of the Theodros Kiros uh, with Victor Wallace, whom I introduced uh, to be uh, one of the lead, uh, leading um, radical democratic thinkers in the country. And I hope you have enjoyed his um, uh, cautious analysis, uh, his refusal to uh, hypothesize, uh, but he has given you a substantive analysis of his understanding, and he has particularly motivated you in invoking uh, Aristotle, uh, the philosopher of citizenship, that it's not enough to simply come every four years, vote and disappear, that the political life, the life of the vigilant, um, awakened citizen is a continuous participation, a continuous uh, willingness to, uh, to, start to sacrifice one's uh, particular interests uh, on the behalf of the common interest and be willing to protest, to march, uh, to fight, not necessarily uh, physically, but morally and intellectually, uh, so that the, the vision of the common good could be articulated uh, to, to result in a society that is willing and capable of providing 
food, shelter, clothing, and most particularly health and safety to its citizens. A citizenship then is an activity of participation. It is not necessarily uh, to be limited to uh, casting a vote. Uh, casting a vote is, is merely the formal dim dimension of what it means to be a citizen. The substantive one, the, the one that lasts is uh, vigilant activity, vigilant participation in, in the life of the polis. This has been your host, uh, Theodros Kiros for Afghanistan. Thank you, Theodros.